Um, hello, everyone. Welcome to the Flow uh, seminar series. This is a seminar series on federated learning, broadly construed. We host speakers on a wide range of topics, including machine learning, distributed optimization, privacy, and uh, cryptography. If you have any suggestions for speakers, be, be, uh, please feel free to uh, contact the organizers. So before we start, two quick admin things. Uh, if you have questions during the talk, uh, please either write them into the chat or raise your hand. And then at the first kind of available slot, uh, Samuel can uh, unmute you. And then the second thing um, is uh, to mention that this talk is being recorded and it will be available on YouTube um, after afterwards. So uh, with uh, that aside, I'd like to introduce Peter Davis, who's uh, currently a postdoc at IST Austria in Vienna, where he is an IST Plus fellow. He works on distributed optimization and machine learning. Uh, before that, he uh, did a PhD with Arthur Chumai at the University of Warwick, studied uh, studying distributed graph algorithms. Uh, his PhD thesis was completed in 2018 uh, on algorithms for radio networks and won uh, several awards, like a best in paper award at Potsy and the Warwick Thesis Prize in 2020. So today he will talk about a new method for communication compression in the context of distributed optimization, in particular for federated learning. So I'll hand it over to him. Uh, looking forward to your talk, Peter. Thanks very much. Yep, so uh, this is joint work with Peter Krishna, Guru Nathan, Nisha Mosrefi, Saleh Ashkbus, and Dan Alistair. Um, and I'm going to be giving this talk kind of backwards from my perspective, which hopefully will make it forwards from your perspective, because uh, we didn't really come from this from federated learning. Actually, we came up with this as a means of reducing communication for gradient quantization in kind of standard distributed stochastic gradient descent. But we later realized that it has applications, in fact, possibly better applications uh, to federated learning, among other things, uh, as we'll see. So. That's why if you go and look at our paper, uh, you might notice that it doesn't actually mention federated learning at all in its current form. So I uh, don't let that put you off. Hopefully by the end of this talk, you'll realize why this is relevant to federated learning. Uh, but the, the application side of this towards federated learning is still kind of a work in progress. So um, that's not kind of the focus of the paper if you go and read the paper, uh, but hopefully we'll unite them in this talk. So uh, what is the federated learning application? I'll start with this. Uh, we are going to try and train some model using federated averaging or some other variant. The details of our algorithm here don't really matter. Uh, and that's going to work as follows. We have some server and the server has a model and it's trying to gradually increase the uh, how good this model is by sending it to some clients. It has some possible universe of maybe a huge number of clients that all have some data which can be used to increase the quality of the model. Uh, but these clients, you, uh, you never know which of them are going to be online and are going to want to participate in the training process at any time. So you just get some kind of subset of them that you don't really get to choose. Uh, again, we're not really focusing on the kind of the whole process of federated learning here. So we don't really care about you know, how the subset is chosen. Um, that would be something kind of specific to, uh, to an eventual application. But all we care about at the moment is that the server has a model. So here's a model. And it's trying to send this to some of the clients. Um, OK, so each client then uses this data to produce some update to the model, hopefully making the model more accurate somehow. It then sends the model back, the new model. Uh, the server gets several of these from various of the clients, and then it averages them to get its kind of final model for this step. And then this is repeated until the model is deemed to be of sufficient quality to be used, or I mean, maybe it's always updated constantly. We don't really care. Uh, and anyway, uh, so that's this is the kind of general application. The details don't really matter for what we're going to talk about today. Um, so what's the problem here that we're going to try and solve? Well, the problem is that we usually consider our models to be very large. So these are big you know, uh, groups of parameters from neural networks or whatever. There's some very high dimensional vector, essentially, is how they're represented. Uh, and this takes a lot of data to store. And in particular, it also takes a lot of data to send. And that's a problem because uh, in federated learning, particularly, we're sending maybe to just mobile devices of the general public who don't want us to be using up all their uh, device capability to send them giant models all the time. Uh, 
so we want to try and minimize the amount of communication we're actually using here. Uh, okay, so what's our approach to doing that? Well, we just want to somehow make our model smaller. So we take our model and we want to quantize it. And what that means is we want to round it to something that's close to our model, but we can specify it with far fewer bits than a full precision model. So we take our model, we turn it into something close to a model, but that's much smaller. And then we send that to the clients instead. And they do exactly the same process from then on, on this quantized thing as they would have done on the original model. Hopefully, if our quantization is good, this doesn't really affect how the algorithm works. Uh, and the properties we want from our quantization to make this good is that it's unbiased. So the quantization should be some randomized procedure using local randomness at the server so that in expectation, the expected value of the thing that you quantize to is exactly the original model. Um, and assuming that we can make it unbiased, we then want it to have low variance because the variance then is basically a measure of how far away what we quantize to was from the original model. So it's like the error, well, it's really the error squared um, of our quantization procedure itself. Uh, so that's our goal here. And we have then a kind of trade off between the number of bits that we use to specify the model and the variance we get in doing so. Uh, okay, so what are the existing ways of doing this? Well, there is a huge amount of research for quantizing or otherwise specifying gradients for performing SDD usually. Um, so here's just some selection, but I mean, this is a very small subset. There's papers vaguely related to gradient quantization coming out pretty much every week on archive. Um, and I mean, gradients are kind of similar to models. They're still high dimensional vectors. If it works for a gradient, you might think, why doesn't it work for a model? Uh, but actually most of these techniques don't work very well for models. Um, so we'll explain why shortly. Um, and the reason is basically that if we look at what these schemes are doing, they take this point. So this purple dot is what we're trying to quantize here, uh, whether it's a gradient or a model for now, but we'll assume it's a gradient because we're looking at how these gradient quantization schemes work. And what these schemes usually do, not all of them, but most of them, are, oh, we have a raised hand uh, question. Right, let me have you with you. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. So quick question, uh, do we consider the quantize also, uh, quanti quantization of the model also from the device to the server? Uh, yes, yeah, you will use it both ways, but uh, for simplicity probably I'll only present from the server to the uh, device, but the device can do exactly the same thing in the other direction, yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks. Uh, so uh, yes, we are looking at what current gradient quantization schemes do. Um, and what they do usually is they take this uh, vector they're trying to quantize and they divide it by its norm to scale it down into the one ball. Uh, so now basically you, you store the norm separately and what you have basically now is an angle that tells you a point in the one ball. And then to quantize that, they map to one of some quantization points they set up somehow in the one ball or near the one ball. Uh, so imagine that this black point was the quantization point that was chosen. And then they send both this black point and the norm of the vector. And then the receiver can just multiply these two together and receive a final quantized point. Uh, the problem is that this last scaling step increases the error that you get from the quantization proportionally to the norm of the vector. And that's what we're going to try and avoid in this talk. So pretty much all the gradient quantization schemes get error which is um, which scales with the norms of the vectors you're trying to quantize. So why is that okay for gradients but not models? Well, if we look at, if we just imagine that we're somehow training some model by any normal technique, uh, we look at what the gradients actually look like at each epoch of the training, uh, they'll start somewhere, they're very noisy, uh, they'll go all over the place. Gradually, as the training gets better, you expect the gradients to get closer and closer to zero. Um, so, most of the gradients, if you look at after the first maybe few epochs, start to get close-ish, not very close, but um, 
the kind of signal to noise ratio is basically that they are roughly centered around zero. Uh, and this means that essentially quantizing and getting an error which is proportional to their norm is pretty much the best we can do. We can't really hope to do better than that without any other specific um, information to the problem that might help us. Uh, whereas models, if we look at what models look like, uh, and this is this is smaller because it's zoomed out, so I assume that this is zoomed out, but the uh, center is still the origin. Uh, they might start some random place and they might make big jumps at the start, but after not too long, we hope that they eventually get close to what's going to be the final model, and then they start to converge around that. So after the first few epochs, most of the models are packed into some quite tight ball, which is probably nowhere near the origin, because if our final uh, model ends up being all zeros, then we feel like we've done something wrong and wasted a load of time training. Uh, so this is the difference, right? And what we want here, or what we see here, is that a quantization scheme which gets error dependent on the norms of the vectors to quantize is decent for gradients, but probably isn't good for models because they're centered around somewhere which is nowhere near the origin, so their norms are pretty large. Um, okay, so I'll try and formalize this a bit and then I might stop for questions. Uh, so this is our basic, most basic toy problem that's actually formalized. We have our server here and the server has some value x in uh, the reals to high dimension d. And you can think of this as the current model that it's trying to send to a client. Uh, the clients, they also have some vector z which we can think of as the last model they saw. So they remember what they saw last time, what they sent to the server and uh, stuff's happened since then. The server's average load of models talk to a load of other clients. So this is some older model, but from the picture we saw last slide, as long as it's not too old, we expect still that it's reasonably close to X. Um, and the server wants to send some quantized value, uh, quantized X and send it to Z, uh, send it to this client using not many bits. And uh, in particular, we want to use about D bits, uh, order of D bits, uh, where D is a dimension. So um, a constant number of bits per coordinate. Now this is a bit misleading maybe because uh, the schema I'm actually gonna show you doesn't do things coordinate wise, so, or at least not coordinates in the standard basis. So we're not actually sending some fixed amount of bits per coordinate, but even so it turns out this is the amount of bits we can really hope to use unless we want to really blow up the variance. Um, and as I mentioned, we want this unbiasedness property where the expectation of what we send is exactly what we wanted to send, uh, but we didn't have enough bits for the precision to do so. And we want to minimize the variance, uh, but not without uh, making the number of bits too high. And what these uh, previous gradient quantization techniques usually give us is that the variance, as I said, is um, basically proportional to the norm of the vector you're sending squared, because the variance is squared, but basically that means the error is proportional to the norm of the vector. Uh, and what we want instead is that the variance is proportional to the difference between x and z squared. And we're hoping, if our picture from the last slide was accurate, that that's going to be a lot lower because these models, even like reasonably old models, are much closer to each other than they are to the origin. Uh, okay, so how do we know this is even possible? How do we know that we think we should be able to do this? Well, there's a simple way of doing this, which has been proposed for other settings, um, and it kind of works here, but has some major downsides that at least shows us that this could be something we can hope for. Uh, so what could we do? Well, instead of just trying to quantize and send x, we quantize and send x minus z, the difference between the two vectors. And then the receiver just adds z back on and it gets something which is basically x plus the quantization error. Uh, and since the vector we're now quantizing is x minus z, using these existing schemes, we get precisely that the variance is the norm of x minus z squared, so the difference between the vectors. Uh, okay, and that's what we said we wanted, so why aren't we happy here? Well, uh, the server to do this has to actually know Z. And that means it has to remember this other model Z. Uh, okay, so the server has to remember one more model. That shouldn't be too much of a problem. It's already doing stuff on models. But in federated learning, we have a ton of these clients and they all participate at different arbitrary times in the process. They all have different older model Z. So it needs to remember for every single client, a model which was the last model that client saw. And that's a lot of stuff to remember. Uh, that's a huge amount of space the server has to keep and it also kind of has uh, privacy concerns and things because you're keeping actually quite a lot of data about each individual client. Um, so this is far from ideal and we want to get this variance guarantee without these downsides. Uh, okay, so here might be a good time to stop for questions if there are any questions. Um, but 
hopefully this is uh, this is showing you what we're trying to get with the rest of the talk. Okay, we have one uh, question. Yeah. So, uh, so, so this just want to follow the last comment. So, if we have too many devices, how about just like uh, store the one with the minimum, uh, the maximum norm, uh, the maximum distance between X and Z? Maybe Z I is the one to to to, to achieve that. Uh, right, but so it's it's not enough just to know uh, the distance here, right? You have to actually know another vector that the device holds, which means that each time you have to tell all of the devices which vector Z you're using. But but I, I just, for example, I receive like one thousand vectors. I just pick the one with the maximum distance, and I'm I quantize between that distance, and then when I send to different device, the, the other like the distance to recover should be smaller than than the variance. Yeah, but it's it's not enough just for them to have a vector which is closer. They have to actually have the specific vector z that you sent x minus z to add back on. Otherwise, what they're reproducing on the other side is not x or particularly close to x. Right? If so, if I have a z1 and z2, uh, z1 is further away, and I send x minus z1 to everybody, then the guy with x2 um, calculates x. Uh, sorry, Z2 calculates Z2 plus the quantized X minus Z1, which uh -huh. is not X, and we don't really have any guarantees on how close it is to X other than that it's, you know, no further away than Z1 and Z2, but we haven't actually improved anything here. All right, so, so the issue is that the receiver has to know exactly which vector Z um, the sender intended when it sent X minus Z. Okay. Uh, so, I mean, hopefully that will become clearer when we uh, see the actual scheme, but I don't know, maybe not, but I'll uh, take more questions after okay. a, yeah, a yeah. pause. Probably, no, no, that's fine. That's fine. Thanks. Um, okay. So, uh, what do we do instead? Well, the issue came from scaling these vectors down to the one ball. That's what the scaling is what made us get error, which was dependent on the norms of the vectors. So, we don't want to scale these vectors. We don't want to move them anywhere. We want to keep them how they are and quantize around where they are. Uh, so to do that, we fill the whole space R to the D, because these vectors could be anywhere in R to the D, with quantization points. And the way we do this is using lattices. So I won't really go into lat what lattices are. Um, if you're interested, they're a subset of points, which is specified by basis. And you just take all integer combinations of the basis. Uh, and that gives you all the points in the lattice. Um, but we don't really need to know what they are. We just need to know some useful properties for the sake of this talk. Uh, and what this means is that wherever this point is in the space R to the D, there will be some nearby lattice point that we can hopefully quantize to. And that's what we do. We somehow round in an unbiased fashion, which I'll talk about how to do shortly, uh, to one of these nearby points. And we also associate all of these points with some bit string. And then we just send a string of bits to the um, receiver. So what properties do we need of lattices that this actually works? Uh, so firstly, we need that we can always find nearby lattice points because the error from our quantization is precisely the distance to the lattice point that we're quantizing to. So we need that they're always nearby lattice points, but we don't want too many of them because the length of the bit strings that we assign to nearby lattice points, uh, basically all nearby lattice points up to some kind of hand waving of what nearby is, have to have different bit strings so they can be distinguished. So we don't want too many nearby lattice points because that would mean we'd have to use a lot of bits. Okay, so we want nearby points, but not too many nearby points. And they also need to form a convex hull around the vector we're trying to quantize, this purple vector, uh, because that's gonna be how we make it unbiased. So if you have a choice of points to quantize to and they form a convex hull around the point you want to quantize, then you can always probabilistically weight them in such a way that the expectation of what you map to is exactly your vector, and that's what we want for this unbiased property. So these are properties we get from existing lattice literature. There's quite a lot known about lattices from uh, you know, actual mathematicians. Um, we can find lattices that have all these good properties. And then we still have one problem, which is that these lattices have an infinite amount of points. They have to, to actually cover all of the space after the D still. It's a countably infinite amount of points now, but it's still infinite. So there's an infinite amount of points with the same bit string. Uh, which means we still don't actually know how to decode this at the other end to a particular point. Uh, and the way we do that is say, 
uh, because we're assuming now that all the vectors in our system that we're using, so you know this uh, x and z that we saw on the other slide, are reasonably close, the receiver knows that this vector and the quantized vector should be within some ball of its own input. So the receiver has this ball and we specify the lattice in such a way that there'll only ever be one point in this ball with a particular bit string. And that means the receiver can know exactly which point was intended by this bit string, even though there are these other points further away with the same bit string. Okay, so basically you can decode by just choosing the closest lattice point with that bit string. Uh, okay, so that's the scheme. Um, you don't really need to follow the scheme if you, you know, don't know what lattices are or whatever. Um, I guess it's it's just a way of filling the space with nearby points that have these good properties that mean we can use few bits and get low error in the distance to the point that we quantize to and unbiasedness. Uh, okay, so what we get in this toy problem is that exactly what we wanted, that the variance of our quantized vector x is something which is basically the norm of the difference between these two vectors squared. Um, and this device can still decode it and get this quantized vector. And the server now doesn't need to store anything. It doesn't need to know z in particular. Uh, so we now can do things like, you know, we're sending to multiple devices in the same round. They all have different z. Um, what x is send, uh, this server sending now doesn't depend on z. It sends the same thing to all of them and they all decode it correctly, even though they have different z. Uh, clients, though, they need to remember this model set, but I mean, they, they had this at one point anyway, so we're not introducing any extra space. Uh, whether that's a problem to you, I, I don't know. It gets to depend on the uh, implementation as to whether you want clients to have to remember this model, but um, it's at least, you know, it's not going to exceed their storage capacities because they have to store it at some point anyway. Uh, okay, so that was the kind of informal toy problem setting. Um, our actual results are stated in the following form. So we have a bunch of machines. Uh, they all have vectors, uh, so you, you don't have to read this whole paragraph. I'll point out the important bits. And if these vectors are all within some distance y, then we can quantize them and communicate them even in a decentralized fashion. Uh, um, and we can average them so that the, uh, the variance we get at the average uh, of the final average after having communicated all these quantized vectors and averaged them is low. And we get this expression for what the variance should be. Uh, basically, it just has the number of bits. So if we were using D log Q bits um, per machine, then the variance is basically the original variance, which is roughly Y squared, divided by Q squared, where Q squared is this, uh, Q is the thing that appears the number of bits. And we have a matching lower bound saying that you can't beat that. Uh, this is optimal if you're looking in terms of this vector difference Y. Uh, unfortunately, these bounds aren't really phrased in a way that makes it obvious at first glance that these are optimal, but take my word for it or read the paper, these are optimal um, asymptotically in terms of B, uh, these, these match. Okay, uh, so that's if we have fixed deterministic inputs. Uh, often in settings such as stochastic gradient descent, we assume that our inputs are randomized. So we have this randomized variant, which is actually the, the kind of main variant we put in our paper. Um, where instead, the only difference here basically is that instead of this bound, this fixed bound y squared on how far these, or y on how far these uh, vectors are apart from each other, we instead assume that these vectors are chosen randomly around some unknown true vector, uh, this true gradient here, delta. Um, and then we have a bound on the variance of these input vectors. So these input vectors are random, we have a bound on the variance. This is a bit weaker than having a strict bound on how far apart they are, but we still get essentially the same um, trade-off between bits and output variance, except that uh, uh, there's kind of complications here, but basically the, the gist is that you can't beat the output variance that you got from input variance, like you can't actually, uh, I mean, you're taking average, but you can't beat the fact that you, if you just averaged all the uh, inputs exactly, you still have some variance. So that's why this is slightly different. Uh, and again, we have a matching lower bound. Um, so this is matching in, in most cases. There is kind of one gap here, which is if you care about, uh, rather than giving each, bit, uh, each device a fixed budget, if you look at the expected number of bits used by each device, this isn't quite optimal, but we have then fixed that in later work and made it optimal for a kind of all settings. <laughs> 
Uh, okay, so this is probably another good place to stop before I go on to applications and experiments and stuff, whatever else is in my slides. Uh, for questions, if there's any. I have one question uh, about uh, the motivation that he used. Uh, so you mentioned uh, the work of Mishenko and Kalpers on quantizing uh, differences. And you said that uh, one of the main disadvantages is having to remember all of these models being sent by the devices. Uh, but in that work, uh, all that needs to be remembered by the server is the sum of all of those models, not those individual models. Would that still be a problem? Uh, I guess it would depend on the setting. So I have to say I'm uh, I'm more, much more on the theory side and I, uh, I don't really know um, exactly how these apply to federated learning settings. Uh, so I guess I'm kind of just using this as an illustrative example. Uh, really, we're hoping that this is used for completely decentralized model quantization where you can't do any of that stuff at all. Um, but it, it may be the case, and uh, if you say this, I'll take your word for it, that they have ways around this problem too. Um, yeah, but uh, we're, we're particularly hoping to do this completely decentralized where you can't really send differences at all because you don't know anything about your communication partner. Yeah, so, so in, in that algorithm, uh, all the server needs, needs to be able to do just, just add up all those updates and uh, remember that uh, sum. Uh, it doesn't, doesn't have to remember the individual models. Okay, I'll, uh, I'll have to go and have another look at that, that paper then, I suppose, but uh, okay. thanks, I'll uh, bear that in mind. All right, thank you. Can I have uh, a question? Oh, sorry, sorry, Peter. Yeah, so, so, so just my question is, like, right now you're, uh, you're talking about like, compressing a model, and you were talking about like, having unbiased estimate of the model. But like once you send, let's say, like this X, this might be like this might be the weights of of the neural network. But when you send it, like when you compress it and send it, and then you evaluate, let's say, on, on each client uh, with this unbiased estimator, it doesn't mean that the output of the network is also unbiased, right? Uh, you mean I'm not sure exactly what you mean. So the the vectors that these clients get are unbiased and. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, uh, but I mean, but having yeah, like but unbiased then, estimator of the weights doesn't up, doesn't actually doesn't guarantee that like when you you like uh, when the you actual output weights, of the neural network. Never, yeah, the the actual yeah, like, so, the, the yeah, actual I mean, update is unbiased. Yeah, so I mean, we're we're treating this because it's kind of a black box here because basically what we're what we want to show is uh, just um, a way of efficiently sending vectors. That's all it is. So. What neural networks actually do, we haven't gone too deep into because you know this isn't just for neural networks. Actually, we're um, we're just trying to optimize the single step of sending the vectors between client and server. Uh, what happens after that, you know, um, we're we're not really paying attention to, except that you know having you have to get some variance. Producing the variance here probably can't hurt us, although you know they have some weird effects. So actually, maybe sometimes it does hurt us to reduce the variance. But basically, all we're doing here is we have to have some noise, we're reducing the noise. What happens after that, we don't know, but lower noise is usually better. Okay. Okay, thanks. So I'll, uh, I'll go on to, okay, so this is the kind of selling our approach slide, which maybe I should have had before taking questions, um, but uh, we'll see. So yeah, we get these optimal error guarantees in terms of the difference between the vectors in our system rather than the norms. Um, and, as I was saying, so we, we, um, I was doing this from a federated learning approach because it's a federated learning series of seminars, but this wasn't originally intended for federated learning and really it's not even just for gradient center or anything like that. Uh, you can do it for pretty much any time you want to send large dimensional vectors. So, I mean, we haven't um, gone too deep, in, deep into applications yet, but for example, you could use this for k-means or basically anything else with high dimensional vectors. Um, and we expect this improves over previous methods. I mean, depending on what the previous methods are for this, for whatever problem we're applying it to, but we at least expect it to be good when we have some reason to think that these vectors we're dealing with are closest to each other and not necessarily close to zero. Uh, so this is, yeah, I want to try and um, labor this point that, uh, you know, I've introduced this as a thing for federated learning, but really it's uh, a very general scheme for quantizing any vectors when you're sending around vectors for any reason. Um, and we can do this under pretty much any network architecture that allows you to, you know, if, if you want to compute a global average and you have to well, be able to com communicate eventually 
through the whole network, but you don't even necessarily need to have to commute, uh, compute a global average. You can just have, for example, random pairwise interactions, things like that, that still works. Uh, also, I introduced this under two norm, but you can do this for pretty much any LP norm and L infinity norm. And you can tweak the amount of bits you use to make it have lower variance. You can even reduce the bits below D bits. So you can have sublinear number of bits uh, in the dimension that that does necessarily because of the lower bounds uh, blow up the variance that you get. Uh, okay, now the honest slide. What are the problems with our approach? So um, the main one is that I've said that there are these lattices that have these good properties, but for if you're interested in L2 norm, which a lot of applications are, actually working with these lattices, all known methods are very expensive computationally, uh, which means that, I mean, there are kind of ways of putting most of the work into pre-processing so that you could maybe hope to do this stuff for dimension up to maybe 32 or so. Beyond that, really, at the moment, we don't have any efficient way of working with these optimal lattices. So that's the downside. Uh, on the upside, we can use the standard cubic lattice, so the, the lattice based on the standard basis. Uh, and this works actually pretty well in practice still, even though it's, it makes the algorithm very simple. Um, and we can still get good theoretical guarantees, not quite optimal, but not too far off, uh, using some known tricks in particular, if we pre-process with a random rotation based on the Hadamard matrix, uh, as done by Shiresh et al. Uh, then we get basically only logarithmic extra factor in the error that's suboptimal. Um, so that's the first drawback. The second drawback is that we need some estimate of how far apart these vectors are in order to scale lattices appropriately so that all of this works. Uh, so that's also a problem, but uh, our estimate doesn't have to be that good. Uh, we have a way of testing if your estimate's too low and then increasing it. So even if you have some really low estimate, the vectors are actually far apart, it doesn't just break. Um, it, we have a way of fixing it on the fly. Um, and in all the applications we've seen, we can just do basic heuristics like averaging the last few distances you saw or um, in some cases, you can compute an estimate distance only from your own data. Uh, and these have all sufficed so far, but it's very application dependent here on as to how you should be getting this estimate. Um, but yeah, all, all I'm saying here is basically that it's pretty robust to how you get your estimates, but you do need an estimate of some kind. Uh, okay, so um, on to experiments. So as I said, uh, we didn't come at this from federated learning, so this is kind of a recent applications so we don't actually have any specific federated learning experiments to show you here. Uh, we do have some kind of relevant ones on local SGD where we are doing so we're, we're doing SGD and we're on each of our machines running several uh, gradient update steps at once um, or not at once but you know locally and then we're uh, quantizing models and averaging models after those several update steps um, and for that we get pretty good results compared to some of the state-of-the-art gradient quantization methods. Uh, so with the blue line here, LQSGD is uh, our algorithm using the cubic lattice. Uh, L stands for, well, the acronym stands for lattice quantized stochastic gradient descent. Um, we are not using random rotation here as the uh, Hadamard um, line here is doing. So if we use random rotation, we probably also see a, a slight improvement. Um, so it works quite well on this setting, which is hopefully pretty similar to what the experiment is going to look like for federated learning, um, but we'll see. Uh, so also we've got some other experiments. So there's this power iteration algorithm for eigenvector computation, where basically you, you keep some estimate of the top eigenvector of a matrix, and then you have some iterative formula for improving it by taking powers of matrix and multiplying them and stuff. Um, but really what's important here is just that we're sending around and quantizing this vector, which is our estimate of the top eigenvector. Uh, and I mean, this you expect this to converge around whatever the top eigenvector happens to be, which can be far from the origin. So we expect LQSGD to do well here compared to gradient quantization techniques, and it does. Uh, so we're the blue line here, which is um, closer to the baseline than the others. And we can use it for SGD. So uh, this is for least squares regression. And again, we perform quite well compared to gradient uh, quantization schemes. Uh, for the sake of honesty here, uh, we originally hoped that this would work well on neural networks, but from our kind of picture earlier in the talk, actually neural networks, their gradients are very noisy and they pretty much are centered around zero most of the time. So we have results for neural networks. 
uh, we're reasonably competitive, but we don't really improve over previous techniques because uh, you know this the difference between the vectors in our system is pretty much the same as their norms. So we don't really hope to get an improvement there, but it's still okay. It does the job. Uh, right. So that's the end of the talk. I think uh, if you're interested, please check out our paper. But don't be alarmed when you search for federated learning and there's nothing there. Uh, and any questions? So there is one question in uh, in the chat by by Constantin. Uh, let me just unmute you. Thank you for the talk. Uh, I have one uh, question: uh, How the size of the lattice is estimated? The size of the lattice. So you mean like the side length of the lattice? Yes. yes. Uh, yeah. So this is this is why you need this. Um, where was this slide? Uh, that's why you need this estimate of how far apart these vectors are, this estimate of maximum vector difference, because that's what we use to scale a lattice appropriately. Um, so yeah, as I say, there's a, you can, depends on your application, how you get that, but we so far haven't seen an application where you can't get that reasonably easily. So this value is pressed up. It's what, sorry? So it's, uh, it's in some way estimated or Yeah, so whenever you have you, whenever you have an interaction between two machines, for example, uh, they can first talk to each other and try and agree on what they want this difference to be. And I mean, this is just a single number that you're sending. It doesn't have to be very high precision. So it's, this is not much communication here that you need to do uh, first, or you can have some way of doing it so that everyone already knows what the number is. Yeah, but it really it depends on your application, but it hasn't been a problem so far in applications. Because I just want to share, uh, I mean, I didn't work with uh, such quantization techniques, but uh, for example, uh, in some in a, another practical implementation like TensorRT, the inference engine from NVIDIA, uh, they have a quantization schema for weights, for parameters of the neural network and uh, approach that they used I mean, one year ago at least was that they uh, quantize weights uh, in the regular grid uh, and uh, scaling was uh, selecting dynamically uh, that they tried different scales and they estimated uh, distribution of the next activations in the layer of the network and measure some like scale divergence between this distribution and distribution uh, which can be achieved uh, without quantization at all and dynamically selected this uh, scaling for each layer of the network. But it's about inference, it's about quantization weights. Just like right, yeah, I mean, so yeah, that if, if um, kind of elaborate methods work to get much better estimates, then that would be great for us. But uh, you don't need something that elaborate, you can just, you know, see what the differences you actually got in the quantile vectors you received were for the last five rounds and average them, and that usually does the job. I see, I see, okay, thank you. So I would have a question. Uh, so you're assuming that minimizing the variance is the thing to be done. Now, this is very intuitive. It's some measure of the spread of the difference uh, among these, uh, these points. Uh, but uh, uh, have you seen some applications where something else is the thing to be minimized? No, something uh, else than variance. So, I mean, we certainly have seen some applications where on neural networks where we've minim where we've reduced the variance and somehow made the accuracy worse. Uh, but it, it's not at all clear to us what we actually should be minimizing in that situation. Um, so yeah, neural networks, it's, it's not necessarily the case that minimizing the variance in this way does help, but it's, you know, unless until we work out what we actually are meant to be minimizing, there's not much we can do to, to fix that. Uh, but I mean, in general, we're just minimizing the error distance that you get from quantizing. So in most applications, we expect that that's a good thing. Uh, so but let again, me ask a slightly different question. Uh, so how far do your techniques, analysis techniques extend from variance to something different than variance? Now, 
uh, irrespective of the potential pl applications of, of such gen generalization. Uh, uh, so, I, okay, what we, what we actually get rather than variance is we actually get an absolute bound on how far away the, um, the quantized vector is from the vector is. It's not randomized. Well, it is randomized, but there's an absolute bound on how big it can be. So uh, we're only giving it as variance because we have this, like uh, our, our kind of main setting is that the inputs are randomized and then you have variance from that. But actually, if your inputs are deterministic, we get an absolute bound on the quantization error. So it's it's stronger than variance. You know, it's uh, it's an absolute bound on the distance, the error distance. Thank you. But um, I, I guess that's kind of all we can hope for, although maybe there's applications where we want something else instead. I don't know. Thanks. Makes sense. Okay, can I have also one more question? So, so this is related to my to my previous comment. So, because like for instance, because even if you have like unbiased estimate of, of the of the weights for for the model, anyway, like it's only guaranteed to be unbiased estimate of the actual like output of the model only if you have like a linear model. So so and the actual like error would scale with something like uh, Lipschitz smoothness. So so doesn't that make sense to just have the actual like uh, vector that you communicate just to be closer. So you, uh, you're going to minimize this actual difference rather than let's say variance and you don't need to be unbiased. And maybe it, it doesn't work for a neural nets because like a smoothness constant for that would be like extremely huge or maybe like even infinity. Um, so, I mean, so what, what we what we actually get here is that we we're unbiased and we have an absolute value on the L2 difference or any other norm that you want to use difference uh, between the quantized values and the input for quantization. Uh, yeah, I, I don't really know what the effect on that is on the outputs of the neural network, um, but I think that's probably the best we can hope to do when zooming in on a particular communication stage. Um, so I, I'd maybe try to take up the uh, uh, kind of an alternative answer to that this is this is Dan so basically I mean it really depends on your application so for instance in if you look at the analysis of local SGD and I believe uh, federated averaging would be similar you actually care to estimate the mean of the well, of the models of the clients like at the workers basically so then if if you were to plug this into like if you get a better uh, on like a lower variance estimator of this, then at least your rate will be like your your rate should be better. Um, like whether what this actually does to your outputs, like how much variance you get in the outputs, this is something that's really not. I don't think this is actually captured by the analysis as is. So um, I, I guess it would really depend on, for instance, the quantization, the bit regime that you care about because usually if we quantize models to say 16 bit or 8 bit then your outputs would pretty much are fairly stable and it would stay the same but if you go into a very like drastic regime where like two or four bits then probably your outputs become very unstable and then sort of errors propagate out so um, our method is really aimed towards the setting where what what the method itself wants or, or sort of the application itself needs is a good estimate of the average uh, of, the, of the model. We're not really, I mean, we haven't looked, uh, and I don't think we claim anything with respect to, for instance, um, like output stability under quantization. Does this make sense? Yeah, yeah, yes, thank you. All right, um, so I don't see any other questions, so I think, uh, that uh, I guess we'll thank Peter and uh, well, thanks everyone for watching. Thanks.